Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Poultry Keepers 360 Live. We got a really cool show for you tonight. We got a special guest on top of that. Um, but, you know, let me ask you a question. What, well, breeding poultry for improvement can get to be a little confusing sometimes because it's hard to know where to start first. But what if I told you there's a tool that will point you to where to focus your breeding efforts and in the order of the most important things first? Well, there is. And coming up, I'm going to share with you just what it is. Hey, hey, here we all are. As you can tell, that is not Jeff uh, Maddox in the upper right hand corner. <laughs> he is a. Uh, traveling and, and some lame excuse about he couldn't get internet access where he was staying somewhere out in the middle of uh, Yellowstone National Park. But <laughs> but joining us tonight is Mandolin Royal. And Mandolin, it's a pleasure to have you on the show tonight. Mandolin is our newest co-host on our Poultry Keepers podcast show. And she's doing a fantastic job. Uh, she keeps John and I straight. But she does drag us down some rabbit holes sometimes that uh, uh, get pretty interesting. So, Mandolin, welcome to the show. Thanks for bringing me on today. This will be fun. It will be. And, and I'm glad you could come in at short notice. And I'm glad I thought to remember to ask you. But, folks, what is this tool I'm talking about? Well, Jen, if you pull up that slideshow, we'll get started. All right. So, just a little... Uh... Housekeeping before uh, yes, I was late to the show today and Rip was sitting here all by himself. So he accidentally banned one of our users from commenting <laughs> and we can't figure out how to undo it. So I apologize if that's you. you I don't think the banning lasts past this episode. So uh, I, I will check on that and see if I can undo <laughs> my wrong. And I do apologize for that. Uh, I, I tried to post a comment and ban the poor lady. <laughs> but tonight's show is a tool for making better breeding decisions decision. And what is that tool, Karen? The tool is in your standard of perfection. Now, it's called, Karen, the general scale of points. And that Not you, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Rob. Um, but if we, if we enlarge this to full screen, the scale of points is what judges, readers, and exhibitors go by to determine what a particular portion of a bird is worth in the scale of points. Now, all birds can get start off at really at 100 points, and you do deductions based on uh, those areas and how severe the defects are. For example, symmetry is worth four points. Weight or size is worth four points. All right, now get this. Condition and vigor is worth 10 points. Comb is worth five. Beak is worth three. Right on down the list, you get to the back. And back is worth a whopping 12 points. And then to the breast, another big number, 10 points. And those two big numbers are directly in, related to the body capacity of the bird. So just using this alone, we can see where we should be allocating our breeding efforts. Now, if we go on to the next slide, Karen, well, back up one. Maybe I got them in, in the wrong order. There we go. Ta -da. Um, this section over here on the right, it says white. You get so many points for shape and so many points for color, but those points always add up to, th to the number on the left. And if you look down at the bottom, the shape of a bird or the type of a bird is worth 73 points by itself. Colors just a mere 27%. On white birds. On white birds. And if you go over to the next slide, it shows the other than white, uh, where there's slight some slight variations. Uh, for example, the uh, let me find one here. Do, 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 do. Uh, eye, 
eye color. Uh, nope, that's the same. Maybe there's not any. <laughs> yeah. Yes, there neck. is the back. <laughs> the back uh, and the neck is a little bit different. Tail. Now, yeah. And other than white birds, the shape of the back of uh, the neck is only worth one point, but the color is worth five points. And, and you just go right on down the list. Now, if you're in doubt, you, you know you have some problems with your birds and you see a couple of three problems and don't know which one to jump on first to try to correct. By using the scale of points and then going over backwards a few pages uh, to the deductions for those defects, that makes it really, really clear. And folks, if you've got some questions, be sure to chime in. I shortened this presentation on purpose uh, so that we would have time for questions because we've got a lot of folks registered to attend the show. All right. So you're cutting in and out a little bit, but it's usually just your relation to the microphone. Okay. But it, it wasn't bad. Um, Still. But um, everybody's going to ask, is this outdated? Like, do you get... Are you going to come out of the poultry show with a 73 on your bird? Like, are they, do they assign points anymore? <clears throat> they do not assign points. Okay. And one of the big reasons for it is it would take a couple of days to do a, your average size poultry show uh, and, and really large poultry shows like we're fixing to have in Ohio could take as much as a week because they're anticipating 15,000 birds at that show. That's a lot of chickens and turkeys and ducks and geese and guineas. Um, so, but to score, actually, actually score a bird takes a lot of time. Most but it's, judges, but it's what the judges are using, right? It's what they're doing yes, in their head. Yes. Judges know right. that all in their head. And today, uh, birds are judged on what we call the comparison system. You're going down the line thinking, okay, is this bird better than the one beside it? Or is that one better or worse than the one beside it? So you, you're mentally placing those birds as you're going over them and looking at them. And then you have to handle all those birds. Now, I've, I've done the math on it and it, it really gets frightening, but judges are expected to judge about 400 uh, birds Per show. If you do the math, you start judging at nine o'clock. Well, they want to take a lunch break. Okay, knock off 30 minutes for that. They want to take and be ready to, to be done with the whole show by five o'clock. You literally have about one or two minutes to evaluate a bird when you're judging. That's How much time do you have to evaluate a bird when they're your birds? All the time you want. And that's that's the beauty about it. And that's when this whole scale of point things can really come into the help to you. Now, to use all of this information, you do have to know your breed standard and have a reasonably good understanding of it. And you know, what's what's the back supposed to be? What's it is length, width? What's the body supposed to be? Length, width, depth, all that's in your breed standard. And that's where you can begin to tie all these things together and apply them to what you're doing uh, when you're evalu <clears throat> evaluating your birds to keep as breeders or to keep as show birds. And I see on that, although I've never seen it in my standard, on that top part introductionary there says that there's a separate scale for waterfowl, guinea, and turkeys. Like they don't all... So you got to look at the right Correct. scale of points. For, for each group, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um. <clears throat> All right. Um, and, and I know folks are probably getting thinking, getting ready to pop their hands up. We and... do have one question about this exactly. So okay. let's do that. Lay it on us. So Rob wants to know, do those points vary by breed? Um, they okay. can, Rob, because... Some breeds can have a particular defect that you might not find in others that would require you to deduct a little more heavily on one particular thing or another. And they can have different, uh, they can have very breed specific disqualifications. And, and I'm not 
for for the purpose of tonight show we're not getting into disqualifications because that's an automatic out there is no uh point deduction for disqualifications And I can almost, in my mind's eye, see people raising their hand and wanting to know how long is long? How deep is deep? How wide is wide? That's what happens when you look at the breed standard. Yep. <laughs> could well, you tell I was getting ready? <laughs> I, I could see you were itching there a little bit. All now. right, I'll put my hand down. <laughs> but it's, you got to remember, it's relative to that particular breed. You know, don't compare the back length on a Rhode Island Red to the back length on a Legend, let's say, because it, they're, they're going to be different. That's just like if you looked at a coaching, which should have a short back, and you looked at a uh, Orpington, which should have a short back, they're going to look entirely different just looking at the birds. So compare bir your birds to your breed standard, nothing else. Because when you start going and comparing to other breeds, it's really going to get you messed up. Um, some folks are going to want to know what moderate means. I get that a lot. You know, what is moderate width? What is moderate length? And useless. That's what it is. <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, you know, it, look at your bird. If the back looks so long that it's throwing the balance of the bird off. In other words, if there's if it looks like there's more birds behind their legs than there is in front of their legs, the balance is off. If the back is too short, then it looks like there's more birds in front of the legs than behind. So you want that moderate length. You want it to look in balance and hopefully that makes sense that makes sense and you got to remember too. see remember to see and, and learn to see and train your eye to see the whole entire bird so many times i see people get focused on one part you know for example the top line of the bird and the top line has a lot to do with the shape of the bird but don't disregard the bottom line because that goes to not only the shape of the bird but to the body capacity of the bird if it's not deep enough you're going to have all those organs scrunched in there on top of each other and it's going to affect your production it'll affect your uh, ability to grow to uh, properly digest their feed everything so many things are tied directly in to body capacity on a bird. Now, a little bit later, I've, I've got a video, and I want Mandolin to talk about a post that she made just this morning on Poultry Keeps 360. Great post. Lots of good information, and the video is extremely enlightening. But we'll get to that in, in a bit. Please. Um, let's look at it from the standpoint of a particular thing. And Karen and I was talking about something the other day. On single comb birds, Karen, what's one of the most commonly asked questions? Mandley, you've probably seen it too. <laughs> My bird has too many or too few points. Exactly. Should I kill him? How much <laughs> does it matter? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the scheme of the things, it doesn't really matter all that much. Now, if you go back and look at, at the points that are allocated for the head, I believe that's what five points or something like that. Um, Do you want? Oh, no, no, you're good. You're good. This but, one? No, yeah. go, go back to the, to the other one. There you go. Now, if they have six or seven points, how big a deduction is that? Well, if you come down here close to the bottom and you see single cone breeds, points more or less than required that's a half a point for each point, a half a point deduction for each point. So if you've got a bird that should have five points, but he has seven points, that's only a one point deduction. That's a pretty low number in the scheme of things. Now, if we talk about crooked keels, and that's 
again, going to, to Mandy's post today. But is that more significant or less significant than points on a comb? So That's crooked a lot keel, more than half a point. Yeah. Uh, crooked keel or breastbone is a two to five point uh, deduction. That's a much larger number. So if you're trying to make a decision, do I work on the points on the comb first? Or do I try to correct the crooked keel pro problem first? Crooked keel costs you more. Go and work on that first. Now, I'll add this on uh, combs, and you can usually correct combs in one or two generations. Uh, it's not hard to do. Uh, but let's... Um, now, I, before we move on, I want to mention one thing. And I totally get how folks can get so fixated on the number of points on a comb. Because it's easy. It's a, I can it's, count it's, those. I can. <laughs> it's visual. It's right there in front of you. And you see it every time you look at the birds. But a crooked keel bone, you can't see it from looking at the birds. You actually have to physically handle and examine that bird to find crooked keels. So you've, you've got to, um, to really get into to evaluating your birds. If you're not handling your birds and you're not paying attention to them, you're only getting part of the picture. If you're just going by what you can visually see. Um, uh, lost. My, I got sidetracked in my notes here. I went down that rabbit hole again. That's what I did. It wasn't my fault this time. <laughs> but let's it. let's take a minute and I, Karen, let's show that video that uh, Mandy attached to her post today, and then I want her to speak a little bit to her post that she made today. Okay, I wanted to do just this little video um, because I find this um, uh, carcass really, really uh, interesting. So I am trying to get like a place where I can get a straight on shot at this and I can't because um, his body was just so crooked. So even the spacing on this side is so different than the spacing on this side. And look how crooked, I mean, everything gets skewed because of the crooked keel. So the whole carcass, this bone here, um, this bone here gets really winged out. It has, you know, kind of this outward shape. This one is really winged in. Um, probably because of my profession, I would um, liken this to someone who has scoliosis um, where their vertebra and their ribs are all distorted following the curvature of the, of, of the body. So this is just all super fascinating to me how this side is so much different. The concavity here is so much different than, than this side. Um, I just find it absolutely fascinating. And if you look at it from the top perspective, again, you can see here the different bone um, going kind of outwardly, and then this bone here, um, the same bone going inward. Um, so again, super, super fascinating. Just wanted to share it with you. Um, kind of cool. I really appreciate your friend being willing to go to the trouble, not only to process the bird, but clean all the flesh on it and, and clean up the skeletal process uh, so so we could see that. I mean, it's, it's really a telling video. It really is. And I requested that she keep the bones because she had made me aware of what she was seeing in her flock. And this is not an established flock to her. These are new birds to her and she's been listening. She's been learning and she wants to make the right decisions on what did she start with? She started with 90 chicks and she's going to call them down to just what she wants to breed from. And she's getting her hands on them 
and going through them. And she's looking at all of the express traits. She's handling them to find out if there's any structural flaws. And guess what? She found some. So she's working her way through those birds to get down to her very best. And she said it was oh, like less than 10% that had the crooked, wavy keel. And it was almost assigned to a particular body type. She thinks she knows one more that she needs to call out based on how it's standing, similar to how that one and a couple others were. But kudos to her for getting neck deep into it and really getting them down to the best birds of what she received. Amen. I, I, you're so right there. Share a little bit about what you talked about in your post today. And, and folks, if you haven't read her post, I pinned it to the top at uh, Poultry Keepers 360 uh, Facebook group. Go in and take a look at it because that is serious words of wisdom. But Mandy, expand, expound on that a little bit. About what I wrote or about the video? Because I can talk about the faulty nature of <laughs> how that nope. can impact the rest of the bird. It's function, it's lifestyle. Let's talk about both. Let's talk about both. So because of how significant that was, it wasn't just like an indented keel that didn't affect the rest of the body. It warped the entire skeletal structure of the bird. And when that is so significant like that, it absolutely can impact how the organs can function if that bird had been a female there could have been issues with laying just because of how constricted the internal organs are and i don't know if you've seen i'll have to see if i can dig it up but there's videos that show the egg being made it's ai generated i think or digitized yeah. but there's a lot of movement involved in that laying cycle so they need to have the body capacity to be able to do all of that but um i see we do have a comment where it was asking about if there was a strange gait i would have to ask her about that i would assume so but it wasn't my bird so i don't you know i didn't see that bird every day i'll have to ask her about that from the, from the looks of that skeleton it looked like they would almost have to be a different gait almost like it would have to lead with its right leg to walk every single time just to yeah. get going good yeah. And that's going to affect ranging ability. If you do free ranging or if they need to be savvy enough to get up and away from predators, you need them. You need the birds to be on their A game. And that has a lot to do with how mobile they are. So if it is something bad enough to affect the gate they're they might not get far. That hawk will see it from the sky. And let me scare you all because I <laughs> had crooked keels to that extent. The same as I don't know about the rest of the bones because I was not I necropsied and looked at them, felt them all that, but didn't dry the bones out and see where it ended up. But I would say that there was no obvious from the outside. Now these were big birds; these were ten pound birds. Do you know what I mean? Like, but they're just looking at them, even feeling them from above and from the side, you would not have known how bad that their keels were. Probably even more S shaped than that one was. No. Oh. Um, so, but no difference in gait, no difference in laying, no difference in, now that was late onset. You know what I mean? Like, do you mean that was birds whose keels like after six months started going wonky? Do you know what I mean? Like. Um, that bird in the picture was 16 weeks. Yeah. Okay. So that's super early. Um, so it would have probably just keep getting worse. Yeah. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay, it's been a while yeah. since I've seen it, but in our initial grouping, I did encounter it and I called it out because at that point in my poultry dumb, I was sorting for it and looking for it because yeah. I had heard rumors. And then one day I did put my hands on a bird and I'm like, oh, this is what they were talking about. All right. And I know this isn't a crooked keel show, Rip. So if you need to stop me, let me know. No, no. Y'all are um, fine. If you go back to the station records, like the agricultural station records, they would, um, they had, you know, specific lines for, this is a crooked keel line and this is a straight keel line for experimentation mm -hmm. purposes, right, right? Right. And so one thing to remember about the crooked keels is even in the straight keel lines bred for generations and generations and generations to have straight keels, you still had about 20% crooked keels on those birds. 
So that is never, according to the U.S. Agricultural Station records, that's never going to be something that's going to disappear from your lines. Like there's going to be a percentage of birds still. So just keep an eye for it. Do you know what I mean? You know, obviously the crooked keeled birds had like, I think it was like 8% straight keels. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Where it was still a possibility from the bird. And, but they just bred these for years for that, not, you know, under that category. So just know that it's not a, it's not a there or not there trait. <laughs> so, okay. The that's keel all. I check first when I'm doing my evaluations, just to make sure I can get past that part. Yeah. That's again. And, and once you feel for it, it's a, that's an easy call, but like I said, it comes in at different points, especially because the keel is not a bone when they're young. Do you know what I mean? It's just like, <laughs> what what is it? I don't know. So I was told that roost could cause that. And I see we have a comment that's relating to that as well. Mm -hmm. And as an experiment, when I was seeing it in Moran's, I went through all of my grow pens and I pulled all the roost out. I was like, okay, we're going to get to the bottom of this then. So I pulled all the roost out. And it was still going on. Oh, well, <laughs> that answers that. It wasn't the roost then. <laughs> one one thing, Mandy, and I'll share this. I think that roost can cause at an early date is not so much a crooked keel, but little dents. There's in dents, the keel. yeah, yeah. There's different keel uh, variations of flaws. And that one in the video, that was wavy. It was side to side. It was not... Oh, yeah pulled in like a roost would have caused it. They didn't get that from laying down and putting their belly up against a roost. That that was some side to side weirdness. Well and and you could also see that exaggerated deformity in that skeleton. I, I just it was just Yeah, uh, that was through the whole bird. That was yes, wild. I'm so glad was. she sent me that. Sue, Sue's helping me out. It's cartilage until it uh, solidifies. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's the, yeah. <laughs> I was like, your nose, it's the stuff your nose, it's in your nose, but I didn't, couldn't think of it. <laughs> it could be something else, but we're not going there. Okay, thanks. <laughs> All right. Um, um, so so let's, let's get through, here, we just fall apart. Let's I get mean, a few of the three of these keels and then maybe we'll let Rip get back into his. So. No, 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 no. I, I think this is good. But Mandy, if you would, and I know you, you've got some good input on this because it's something we've been talking about on our podcast. Talk a little bit about the importance of body capacity, because if you go back and look at that scale of points, there's more points awarded to the shape of the body than anything else. Well, everything about that chicken starts on the inside. Yep. And that's everything from the food digestion, from the crop getting down to the gizzard and uh, the heart. And I've seen when I'm processing birds, I've seen, variations within the same hatch the same batch i've seen different sizes of hearts and there's so much to learn about the inside of the bird and after realizing the potential ramifications of having very small bodied very tight squeezed birds before they weren't as productive they didn't grow as fast they didn't do the same as birds that had and it's relative, like what you mentioned earlier about balance, because some people might be saying, well, phantoms are tiny. Their body capacity must be teeny. Like, well, yeah, but it's all relative. It's balanced to the size that they are. Exactly. And well, I lost my train of thought there. But <laughs> <laughs> anyways, build the bird from the inside out and then you'll be getting somewhere. All right, Rip, I want to, since he's here, I want to give Kenny a shout out because, or even yes. earlier when you were talking, this is exactly what was going through my head and I knew it was from Kenny, so I didn't say it, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> that the roost will cause the crooked keel bone, but it's genetics that allow it to happen. So you can, you can have the genetics that want the keels to be crooked and you can prevent it from being displayed in a few birds if you work really hard. <laughs> you can well, present it, you can prevent it from, you know, being, but it, I doubt you can take a awesome, awesome bird and make it crooked. You know what I mean? So yeah, after well, it's I, in there, it's in there. Go Kenny, ahead. I really appreciate that comment because I've never met anybody outside of a trained geneticist that knows poultry genetics as well as you do. 
and and I certainly appreciate the input. Appreciate it. You know, Madeline, you were talking about how body capacity is important and how it affects production and growth and all this kind of stuff. And one thing, and I think we might have mentioned this on a previous show, I'm not sure, but we talked about Don Schreider's work with the American Livestock Conservancy years ago as when they set out to bring back the, um, the Buckeye breed. And Don did exclusive work, uh, didn't trap nest or anything, I don't think that I'm aware of. Um, but he did it actually by just building up the birds' bodies to meet the standards. Birds have a tendency over a period of time, if you don't concentrate on keeping the bodies right, they go in all sorts of directions. So it's something we have to consciously, year after year after year after year, remember to select for. But and I, Don made a, a statement one time that I think is great. Uh, and it, it was in reference to today's standard bred birds not laying uh, like they should have or like they were designed to do. And Don's comment was, uh, you know, if you breed a bird to meet the standard the breed was created for, you'll have a bird that's capable of doing the job that breed was created to do. And that just speaks volumes to me. Um, now I lost my train of thought. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, it triggered a thought. <laughs> there you go. Go save him. Yeah. So, like in my flock, I know what I want them to do and I know what the breed wants them to do. And then I'm watching them all the time on if they're actually doing it or not, because I'll go through selection through several different categories of different age groups. And then I'll have these pullets who have been laying for like a month and leading all the way up to point of lay and into their first month of laying. I'm still looking at them and going, mm, I've seen you lay for a month now and it's not, it's not quite keeping up with the rest of them. And I still find calls. And then when I get up to that one year point, everything up to that point was going like clockwork, but then the egg size never came up to where it should have been. So there's what they could do, should do. And then you still have to evaluate further for if they actually are doing it. And hopefully you didn't set a whole bunch of pullet eggs from the ones who turned out to not be that great at it so that you're not saddled with a whole bunch of the daughters that might follow in her mother's footsteps of actually not being that great. Or you at least mark them well so that you can. Oh, yeah, like permanent to, IDs I'm supposed can, to be starting up on you my can, You can uh, choose to rid yourself of those daughters, even if you happen <laughs> to have them. Or sons. Sons, too. Unless yeah. you keep them long enough to prove themselves in their own right. Yeah. You know, Mandy, you bring up a really good point in getting the females to that one-year point. But a lot of the old-time breeders would never breed from pullets. They only bred from hens one or two years old because that way you were certain about that bird's body. You were certain about that bird's egg size. And you had a really good idea about their production. And that's how a lot of these old breeders, uh, I, I know a lot of the old guys that originated Roland Reds, that's exactly how they, uh, they approach that. Kenny made another comment here, and I want to share that with you. Yeah. He said it's a polygenic, uh, crooked keels is a polygenic trait. So you can improve it by breeding to the lowest intensity for that trait. Another good you comment. Wanna, you wanna, do you want to untangle that in case our listeners aren't quite as advanced as Kenny's listeners? <laughs> no? Okay, we're good. No, I thought he was about to make another one. I didn't. Okay, I, no, I you're good. Mistaken. Okay. Um, Sue says I have to pay attention. All right. <clears throat> so if you just breed to the birds with that have the least crooked keels in order to achieve uh, straighter keels. So polygenic means you can see it and you can choose to breed the lesser of the ones together. So 
until you find and, what you're looking for. And that is not the right way to describe it, but that's what I'm going for simplification. So. Well, <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm very much old school and I'll, I will freely admit that genetics just causes my eyes to cross and sometimes <laughs> chink back into the back of my head. But um, thank goodness that there's folks out there like Kenny uh, that can help dumb old geezers like me uh, <laughs> decipher it all. All right. Before I, are we, are we done? Are we getting close to the end of the keel? Cause I have a comment I want to put up. Well, go ahead and go ahead and lay it All on. right. So Rob wants to help me out next time that if I, <laughs> that if I cook my bird with an Instapot, then I'll actually get the skeleton to look at um, fairly clean. So I'm gonna just believe you on that. But if you cook it for too long, the whole thing will fall apart on you. Yeah. <laughs> I've done that. Yeah. First I have to buy an Instapot just for that. Yeah. Oh, they're pretty handy. <laughs> so. You can have hard boiled eggs in less than nine minutes. Oh, here. So Kenny's trying to help us out here since I did not get it right, but <laughs> <laughs> they are polygenic traits are multi-gene traits, but they are also measurable. So I was focused on the measurable part, not the uh, multi-gene because. Yeah. Karen, you got me going there for a minute. I thought you said the multi-genes. Oh, know. yes. Well, she's right. She was talking about laying and how if they perform well during the lay cycle. So <laughs> I thought the next thing she was going to talk about was do they perform well during the molting cycle? So. <laughs> um, All right. Where are you? Let's, let's take a, a few. I think we've got some other questions. Don't okay. We? Go ahead and put them up. Which one are you looking at? I don't care. Go oh, you it. want me to do it. All right. Um, okay. We already... Well, just, I think we have put this up. That Marita has never seen or felt one. Do you feel them often in shows? I mean, do they occur regularly? I don't find them very often judging. Uh, I have probably, over the years, and I, I got my license back in 94, uh, I have probably found 10 with crooked keels. Uh, I have found it more frequently in... in uh, some strains of turkeys than I have in chickens. But I'd like to think that's because uh, the breeders are on top of it and removing those birds before they make it to a show. Okay. But yeah, I, I have found them. All right. And these two question comments are, are fairly similar. Um, so Shaggy says, he believes you about the number of points on the comb. He believes you about how important the back is, but... He's never, he, she has never seen a bird with a bad head win, even with superior type on the bird. Well, he's never seen me judge before. There you go. <laughs> because I have, I have put up one as a class champion that had six points on the cone, but that bird had immaculate type, immaculate color, and, and it wasn't a white bird. Um, and it, it was a top-notch bird. And we're only talking about, you know, a minuscule amount of point cuts. But I, I have done it before, and I have seen other judges do it before. Does it happen a lot? Honestly, it didn't happen a lot in the shows that I've judged. I can't, I can't speak to other shows. But All right. Um, I understand his point, though. Yeah. Um, well, and it's just striking. So especially if you're at – if you're at – state fairs and oh, non-sanctioned shows and stuff like that, that just, you're like, just, and it's not necessarily the comb, but just like the, the head right. is, is what you see. It's that beautiful bird. Do you know what I mean? That, well, it catch And you know, I will admit I am a head freak. <laughs> I love a good head on a bird. I love the shape of the comb. I like the shape of the head. I like the width of the head. All right. I, so George is throwing out there something that I actually listened to Don Schreider talk about for a long time at a poker show once that some people like to simplify it all the way down to, I always like to look at the head of a bird. A bird with a big head usually has a bigger body and more capacity. And so the bigger, the better. You just need to look at their heads. Forget looking at the rest of them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you should still look. They might have a crooked keel. Yeah. <laughs> uh, George, I will say, and I, I, we appreciate your comment that I can take baby chicks when they first hatch. And if you look straight down on top of their head, 
if you can see an eyeball, that's not a wide head. And the head, well, the body tends to follow the head when it comes to width. Wide-headed chicks usually give you wide-headed bodies. So there's certainly to some validity in what he's saying. Absolutely. But maybe don't stop there. Keep looking. Yeah, keep going. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's that's just one tool. You know, it goes back. You've got to handle those birds. You've got to handle those birds when they're mature, not, you know. Oh, gosh, this is something that gets me cranked up. But I see folks posting pictures of eight, nine, 10, 12 week old chicks saying, which one should I keep for my breeders? How do I know? It's not mature. You can't really evaluate chicks. Now, Don Schreider did find that uh, he did body checks on his birds when they were 10 weeks old. And then he did them again at 20 weeks. And there was a, a tendency for the birds that were good at 10 weeks to be good at 20 weeks, but not always. So get your hands on the bird. You don't know until you get your hands on the bird. Well, and you did a you did a video on looking at younger chicks. So there are some things you can do with the young. You can't yeah. select young chicks, but you can no. unselect young chicks. <laughs> you can and, and, tag them for evaluation later. Yeah. You can uh, answer your own questions. If you come up with a marking system of I wonder mm -hmm. about and then in your notes log what your question was about a particular chick, keep watching it grow, go back, revisit see if you can answer your own question. And, and that, that goes to something that Mandy was talking about in one of the podcasts. Keep a poultry journal. Make notes on everything. You know, what you see coming in your birds, how you see them developing. Are there any birds that are standout stellar stars that you really want to keep an eye on? Are there birds that mm, not so much? But if you'll keep a poultry journal, it can be a real help and a real blessing to you later on down the road. And you can see trends occur year after year after year. I got on my soapbox and got on, went down oh, the rabbit hole. You're good. Again. All right. Well, watch out for those chicken trends. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Rob has a very long thing here. He wants me to try to read. So the commercial egg folks have figured out how to get the bigger eggs. I wonder if the same gene pool might give you big or small eggs, depending on the time of year they mature, if you aren't careful. So, just a spring hatch versus a summer hatch versus a fall hatch. Do you think there's any chance that the birds could end up with different egg sizes? I've, I've had hatched year round before and I didn't see anything significant. Yeah. Personally. I, I would, the only thing that I have noticed is, <clears throat> and I've, I've raised reds for years and they are notoriously slow to mature even under the best conditions. Hey, that's in the breed standard. <laughs> but especially if you're hatching them late in the spring or early in the summer, they just kind of sit around and they don't grow much. And so their maturity is delayed. And, you know, it can take them a little bit longer for the females to get up to a good egg size. But does it have any long-term effects? No, other than that initial slowdown in maturity and, and egg size, and uh, that's the only thing that I've noticed to speak up to any, any extent. All right. All right. I think you're free to move on. Um, <laughs> I do want to mention, you know, we've talked about uh, the standard of perfection and the content in it, not just the breed standard but also those first 39, 40 pages are where you're going to find like the scale of points, deduction for defects, uh, a lot of good basic poultry information. You know, if you will take your breed standard and those first several pages and study the heck out of them, you can become a better poultry breeder. No doubt about it. So care to pop up that last slide. If this, you, one. this one? Yes, that one. Um, <clears throat> you can buy a standard from the American Poultry Association. And just coincidentally, this year, uh, they are going to issue the 45th Standard of Perfection 
It's the 150th anniversary of the APA, and they're doing a special edition of the standard. Now, the price is going up this year. It's a little bit higher than it has been. But if you pick it up at the Ohio National, you can get it for $65. But if you don't pick it up there, it's going to cost you $72.50. Uh and I can see folks going, oh, that's expensive. It is. I, I'm not going to beat around the bush to you. But the value contained in that book is going to be worth far more to you than the $72.50. I, I mean, you're talking, what, three bags of feed maybe? Shoot. that's uh, Just skip a few Happy Meals and Karen lay off those McDonald French fries for a while and you can save it up. <laughs> Um, do you do you happen? I don't. I know you're not on the committee making this book. Yeah. Um, do you happen to know any of the special stuff? My favorite standard is like the 1975 standard. That was an anniversary. It's probably the hundred. I think it was the hundredth anniversary. Anniversary, and it had like extra stuff. It had the chick downs. It Does had... this one have extras? Anyone? Okay. Not that I know of. Karen, we'll find I don't out know. in Ohio. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What extra stuff? I know there's going to be new breeds added that are not currently in the... Well, in plate. the 1975 one, it has the color plates back that they used to publish the, of the feathers. You know what I mean? Like the actual yeah. color plates. Yeah. It has the the chick down uh, standards that they used to that used to be in the book that aren't in the book anymore. Boy, I um, wish that was still in the standards. So they put, they put that... You know, like the chick judging rules. You know what yep. I mean? Like So yep. they put... Basically, I felt like they put everything... That you, they took out in that standard. Um, but were people showing chicks like back oh, yeah. in the day? That was a big thing back really? in the twenties and thirties and forties. Yeah. Big hatcheries would send boxes of chicks to a show to be judged. Yeah. And there was written standard. Well, I'll, I'll send it. Remind me, Mandy, and I'll send you a copy of that. But yeah, there was written standard, not for every breed. Right. Not for every breed. breed. But about at least 10 or 12 of them. Right. Oh I yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And everybody wants to know what's the correct down color on their chicks. So, <laughs> but it doesn't really know, say. It doesn't really uh, say. <laughs> there are people that do study that. Yeah. And they can, they've gotten to where they can reasonably predict what the color of those adult birds are going to be from their line. Doesn't transfer necessarily from line to line within the same breed. Sue and Dobson is right. She tells everybody to read those first pages. Uh, that is so, so important. And if you're, this is a Don Schreider thing too, if you're <laughs> looking to buy an older standard and your bird used to be in the standard, so make sure to do that first. Don't buy a standard from before your bird existed inside of it. No. Um, um, but like those 1940, like 46, somewhere in there, that's when they took the commercial images and stuff out. Yes. Um, so there's more pages in the front if you buy one of those older copies that talks about the practical. Don't, don't go back and buy the ones that were published in the early 1900s. 1900s yeah, no, like the 38, 38 to 48, like that, that, that. I mean, that's when we begin to transition from standard bread poultry to production bread for hatchery poultry. Um, all right. Shaggy. Going to be there. Going to get there. Oh, are they going to have extra copies well, that are not, not pre-purchased? I don't know. My guess is probably not. Hmm. Yeah, because like sort of the print to because books are hard to transport and yeah. especially hard to cover. Yeah, <laughs> um, you know, the bottom line is if you're going to get one, order it early. You know, order it early and save that $7.50. I know that doesn't sound significant, but, um, you know, that's a half a bag of feed right there. Or a third okay. of a bag yeah, of I was going to say, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm going on feed prices from four years ago. All right, here's a question for our guest. Yes. Is there a standard for... <laughs> I'm not going to attempt to say it, so... <laughs> breast. Yeah. North American breast. The E is silent see. on the end. Yeah. <laughs> Just like the S in Moran. So there's a draft standard that's in the works. It's posted on the American Breast Breed Club website, which is 
AmericanBreastBreedClub.org. It models after the French standard with the exception of a slightly higher weight class because of how small the standard is for the French um, Galloway. It's like a, it's the same variety, but a separate variety is complicated. I don't have time for that whole full story yet, but the answer is yes, there's a draft standard. No, it's not official. So we've got time on our side to iron out any details because once it goes in that book, you're not changing anything about it for a long, long, long time. So it has to be right the first time it goes in. Cause I've noticed that some standards that got pushed in quickly then had discrepancies getting them addressed took quite a while. So we want to yeah. avoid that with any new varieties going in, get it right the first time if you can. And Mandy, that brings up another point we need to mention. If you're working with a breed that's not in the standard, okay, and there's several of them out there, breast is one, uh, leg bars are another one, and, and, and there's several of them. Check with the breed club for that breed. Chances are pretty good that they have a draft standard there. And if you're going to show those birds, and you can show them, they just can't win any higher than best of breed. But if you're going to show them, take a copy of the standard and Give it to the judge. You know, be polite about it. Don't you just shove in the face and say, did it by this. But a lot of the judges are not aware of these new breeds. I heard just, you can just clip a copy to the front of the cage in case you don't run into the judge. Or you that, can track down the show secretary, I think. Yeah, that that works until you get a chicken that likes to eat paper. <laughs> <laughs> then you no longer have a copy of the standard there. I wasn't going to bring any parrots. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen chickens. Just devour coop cards. Just devour those standards hanging out there. Maybe so, that's called vigor. <laughs> I thought you were going to say vicious, but uh, but her joke was better. <laughs> if you're judging, she won. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but just come prepared to to help educate the judge. We'll just leave it at that. We got any other questions, Karen? Not really. I want to go back to one, and you took the slides down. Oh. I want to go back to oh. one. Okay, hold on. No, I get it back. Pardon my grammar. There's one in there I, I kind of bounced past it. I think it's important because this is something that so many people miss this. Tell me when. I can't see him from there. Okay. Tell me when. Keep going. You went too far. Thanks. <laughs> Back up. I'm Back working up. on it. You're running out of slideshow. Well, then go back the other way. Uh, let me <laughs> maximize my window so I can actually see what's going on here. Okay. Everybody, just, you know, here's a quick run through. If I had more jokes, I would tell them now. <laughs> This is the only one we didn't really talk about. That's it, Rip. You must yeah, the cutting for defects is the only one that I don't recognize. I, I must not have put it in there, and I apologize for that, because it's pretty important. Okay. There's a section in there called Instruction to Judges, Breeders, and Exhibitors. Okay. okay. And there's about three paragraphs in there that talks about everything that we've been talking about and just tells everybody to pay attention to the production qualities of your birds. And that's what so many folks are not doing. That's what so many judges are not doing. I are one and I'll fuss about them. But um, that that is so critical. It really is. You guys have heard me harp about it on many different shows. Uh, but if, if we lose the production qualities in our birds. They're, that's doing a huge disservice to the breed that we're working with. I was going to show it. I was going to show it, but it's on two different pages, so it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to bring up of the importance of getting them into that productive state because there's a market ready and waiting mm -hmm. for them too. Yes. And I'm seeing more and more interest in standard bred birds that are productive birds. 
Uh, even just three or four years ago, they were almost non-existent. Uh, but lately, I'm seeing more birds that, quite frankly, impress me a lot. They look good. They perform good. And, you know, if, if you're wondering if there's a breed out there that you might be interested in, shoot me an email or, or send us a message on Messenger, and I'll try to steer you to folks uh, as best I can. I know a few of them. I don't know all of them, but I'll do my best to help you. So, The value uh, is in the purebred birds that can replicate the same thing again, and people are growing into the desire to breed their own birds, and you can't do that from hybrids, not reliably. Yep not consistently they've got to be purebred and if you're doing a purebred may as well breed them to standard and then you may as well breed them to be productive because it's what people want at the end of the day is production first and maybe some show feathers yeah <laughs> but karen do we have any more questions no i think you're gonna have to call it well before we go folks i want to remind you if you've not listened to our podcast uh it's called the poultry keepers podcast uh it's hosted on uh, buzzsprout.com or you can find it on uh, Apple Music, Apple Podcast, uh, Spotify. It's on a lot of, of different uh, podcast providers. It's on uh, Amazon. But uh, just search for it. You can find it. And, Should they uh, leave you any bad reviews? No, well, no just I don't want any bad reviews. But <laughs> just leave some good reviews. <laughs> just good reviews. Now, right. just give us an honest review. That's all I ask for. Because I know there's ways we can do better. And I know we do a darn good job at what we do. And it, were it not for folks like Mandy and John Gunnerman, that podcast would not be as good as it is. Or That's even exist. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it would just be Rip all by himself. <laughs> and you know that's not going to work. So. But at any rate, folks, until we talk to you again, we hope that you have fun with your birds, enjoy them, study about them, and we sure hope to see you at the Ohio National in November in Columbus, Ohio. So long, folks.